So in case you missed the news, Visa just announced a brand new crypto project that's going to open up a world of new possibilities for you know what you can do with blockchain. This is a big leap forward for mass adoption. I spoke about this briefly in one of the live streams that we do on this channel. Again, we do these live streams Monday through Friday. Just subscribe to the channel. You'll find out about those whenever we go live. But I want to make this standalone video to actually go in depth in this topic and explain the what, who, how, where, when, why. Because I think this is super critical to understand. I think this is a massive project for the future of blockchain, especially for the crypto skeptics out there that think that, you know, crypto has no real use cases that are applicable for mass adoption. If that's you or you know somebody like that, then you definitely need to watch this video. So I'm talking about that as a blockchain developer who works this technology on a daily basis. If you're new around here, hey, I'm Gregory and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm and subscribe to this channel. And if you want to learn how to master blockchain step by step from start to finish, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's get into this news about Visa's brand new crypto project. So first, you know, this is not the first time that we've seen Visa actually getting into the crypto space. I've made videos about this in the past where, you know, back in March, they started their pilot program with Crypto.com to actually settle blockchain transactions on top of the Ethereum network. Um, we saw Visa, you know, getting the NFT space, buying a crypto punk in the last several months. They've been an overall innovator in this industry, I think for lots of good reasons. I mean, they're in the payments industry and payments are one of the biggest ways that blockchain can actually disrupt the existing systems and bring better value to the end user. And so we just got news that they're building their own blockchain-based payment network for universal payments. And right now, the early stages of that are being built on top of Ethereum. So let's talk about why they're doing this. Well, just like any new technology that provides value to the end user, it's always about better, faster, cheaper. That's exactly what it is in this case. So in, in, think about it in terms of payments. Um, so right now, if you're going to like basically uh, do some sort of transaction with Visa, let's say in a case of international banking, like let's say you got a debit card in one country and you've got you know a merchant in a different country. Well, if you make that transaction, there is so much fat in the legacy system about how the money actually gets you know settled from one place to another. Now, Visa sort of stands in the middle and helps facilitate a lot of this and actually takes on some of the risks themselves before this settlement is actually finalized, okay? Um, but the actual settlement that says, okay, the, the money left this person's account and actually entered in this person's account where it's 100% safe to withdraw, that actually takes a lot longer than you might think. You might have experienced something similar, like if you go into your bank account and you see like a pending deposit, maybe it's a direct deposit, or maybe you use a debit card at, you know, a, a coffee shop or whatever. Transaction finality is pretty bad in the legacy financial system. But with blockchain technology, you can reduce that transaction time significantly. You know, it's basically instant. And so that transaction speed is pretty important because, you know, just like anything else, time is money. And if you can reduce the amount of time that it takes to, you know, guarantee that money move from one place to another, that's an efficiency increase for just the overall economy. And there's also a lot of opportunities to make these transactions cheaper in terms of the actual fees that are being paid to send money. I'll talk about that here in a minute. So I think this is really important to understand for a lot of crypto skeptics out there. I think those broadly fall into two kind of groups. Okay. One is kind of the, the open-minded skeptic that's like, hey, I think this blockchain thing is cool. Cool, but like I don't it doesn't really click yet like why it's super important well I think this is a pretty good example of how you could see that and how you could logically you know extrapolate this out to mass adoption like if Visa starts doing this universally that'd be pretty insane now for the other camp out there is a little more salty uh, maybe they got an axe to grind for whatever reason. I see a lot of bad takes about this floating around online. People are just angry. They're just like, you know, blockchain is just this solution in search for a problem. It's all just like, you know, snake oil salesmen out there talking about stuff that's never going to work. Well, I think this is a pretty good counterexample that you'd have a hard time applying that logic to. All right. And so that's the why. That's why Visa is doing this, basically to create a, um, you know, a better, faster, cheaper payment network. But let's actually let's talk about a second reason as to why. Well, a lot of this has to do with their prominence uh, in the rise of stable coins, number one, and number two, central bank digital currencies. So, of course, stable coins are just stable cryptocurrencies whose price don't change. I've talked about for a long time how stable coins are a pretty killer application of blockchain technology to, to do exactly what I'm talking about, better, faster, cheaper you know, payments, you know, wire transfers, whatever. And the other side of this are central bank digital currencies. Now, you know, there's lots of different opinions about central bank digital currencies. Are they a net positive for crypto or not? Regardless of what you think about that, I think that central bank digital currencies in many cases are going to be an inevitability. And, you know, I think there's strong incentives for central bank digital currencies to actually uh, build those currencies on, you know, public payment rails, or I should rephrase that, payment rails that are built 
by the private sector, not government spinning up their own blockchains, but using existing blockchain infrastructure to implement those central bank digital currencies. And so that's the other factors, C- CBDCs. So you have stable coins and CBDCs and Visa sees both of these two things rising in prominence pretty rapidly. And so that leads us to the what. What exactly is Visa building? So they are building a universal hub to exchange stable coins and central bank digital currencies. So the whole idea is that they're building this layer on top of a blockchain that will that will actually facilitate the exchange of stable coins to transfer stable value and also central bank digital currencies. I think the big distinction here is these things basically being the same thing, but one is by a private issuer and the others actually issued by government. So let's talk about the how Visa actually intends to implement this, okay? So we have some details in this article here put out by Decrypt, uh, but I'll just go over some of these points kind of high level here. You can actually see the smart contract that Visa has implemented to start testing this out, okay? So it's actually being built on top of Ethereum. You can see this universal payment channel contract uh, if you're a developer and you want to look at this code, you can definitely check this out. But that's the important thing to know. It, it is uh, smart contract based. It's being built on top of Ethereum. It's also still a very early stage. So, I, so this is not like necessarily the smart contract that's going to get used for the actual implementation. This is just on a test network. And so also, you know, if, if you want to know more about this, the smart contract actually is using a hash time lock implementation. And so now I want to address one big objection that a lot of people are going to have who are watching this video. They might be thinking like, hey, so if Visa's goal is to do better, faster, cheaper payments on blockchain, then why on earth would they use Ethereum, you know, the network that's just too slow and too expensive for most people to use? Well, we have more details on that, how Visa actually intends to use a layer two scaling solution for this type of thing. That's exactly what this particular payment channel is. So I'll explain what I mean by that. So what is a layer two scaling solution? Well, essentially, this is a environment that sits on top of an existing public blockchain like Ethereum, for example, where you can do things in this environment uh, that you can you can offload a lot of this activity, put it in a second environment, and then you can take the eventual result of those things and then settle it back on the main blockchain itself. Okay, this dramatically reduces the transaction time and also the transaction fees. So that's how you're able to actually do a better, faster, cheaper but actually get the benefit of a decentralized network like Ethereum that has a ton of security, okay? So I've talked about layer twos quite a bit on this channel. If you've been watching any of these videos, maybe you've been tuning into these live streams we do Monday through Friday on this channel. Um, and I've talked a lot about general purpose uh, layer two scaling solutions like optimistic rollups, for example, optimism being an example, uh, also Arbitrum, okay? One of the reasons I've been really excited about these particular scaling solutions is because of their general purpose and that, it, it's sort of like just having an open blockchain where you can build whatever you want to. And you can, you know, just like developers can think of any app they want to. It's permissionless. You just deploy it. And now you have all this sandbox environment to experiment and, and build new things. But that's not the only type of layer two scaling solution out there. There are others that are more proprietary. Maybe they're application specific. Um, we see those see quite a bit of adoption, okay, with uh, DYDX, for example, with Loopring. But these general purpose L2s aren't the only type of layer two scaling solution out there. And so, with Visa, it looks to be like a similar type of thing where it's going to be more of a proprietary layer two that's purpose built for this particular use case. At least that's my read on this at first glance. And so let's talk about some pros and cons of this. So uh, a big pro of this is you can make these uh, better, faster, cheaper transactions with blockchain. You're getting those benefits, but you don't have this open permissionless nature necessarily, but it's okay. So the whole idea here is that the underlying blockchain itself is this open permissionless decentralized thing, and then you can build on top of whatever you want to. So if somebody wants to come in and build a proprietary layer two that actually gets a lot of benefit from the base underlying blockchain itself, then you know you can build whatever you want to on top of this thing. And so there might be another objection to say, well, okay, if Visa basically makes um, you know, this layer two, and it's not general purpose, and that means other people basically have to make changes in order to support this. So we actually see an answer to that in the article here. So uh, what they're saying is, you know, the, the benefit of their solution in the first place is unlike, you know, Bitcoin Lightning Network's layer two, uh, this layer two will basically make it really easy to exchange one currency for another and make these currencies interoperable. interoperable. So probably currencies that follow a similar standard, I'm going to guess is, I'm just going to just guess ERC-20 standard here. That's what they're using the smart contract for. But the, the objection is that means other people will now have to a- adapt to this scaling solution. But they said there's actually pretty strong incentives for other people to do this, especially if Visa can build something with 
pretty substantial network effects. They'll say Visa will have to persuade companies and national governments to devote developer resources to build digital wallets compatible with its proposed universal channel. While some of these entities might not be inclined to participate, preferring instead to keep users within their own currency network, Visa's head of crypto uh, told Decrypt uh, that it is unlikely since a given token will lose influence if it's not part of a broader network. So that's kind of what I'm talking about, that network effect being an actual incentive for people to do this. All right, so those are some details on how Visa plans to build this, you know, central, you know, payment hub for stable coins and central bank digital currencies. And so right now, this is being built on top of Ethereum. So what do I think the future of this looks like? Well, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, could it expand to a different chain for sure? But as I see it, you know, when you're talking about something that requires this amount of trust minimization... Uh, the incentive here is to build on top of something with the most decentralization and security, okay? Because at the end of the day, what they're doing is building their own layer two to facilitate this. That's actually a strong incentive for Visa to do that, okay? But, you know, we, you know, you want to build on top of infrastructure that has quite a bit of decentralization security for it. And that's the strongest bet for that right now is Ethereum in terms of something that actually supports smart contracts natively, but they can have these layer twos that add these, you know, ben- these, these scaling benefits. Because if you're going to build something this massive, like, there's horrors of building on something that has you know, centralization to it that could really undermine the value proposition of something like this over the long term. So that's just sort of my quick take on it. Let me know what y'all think down in the comment section below. So that's all I got for today. As always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. It really helps these videos out so the more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fascinated with this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find any of my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step, or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can become a blockchain master step-by-step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real-world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.